My name is Pete Hampton, and I'm a data engineer here at Elastic Security. This presentation is going to be about monitoring and operating data pipelines and streams with the aid of the Elastic Stack. So uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction, and then we'll talk about data engineering in general. We'll look at two common approaches, which is batch and streaming, and then we'll also look at some advanced use cases with the Elastic Stack to help improve monitoring. So who am I? I'm Pete Hampton. And I work out of Belfast in the north of Ireland. I read my PhD in artificial intelligence. And these days I work in distributed data processing and also distributed systems. Uh, my background varies from search, security, and capital markets. So who are you? You're a developer, a data engineer, a DevOps engineer. Maybe you're a data scientist. But regardless, you're someone who builds and operates pipelines. And also you're an elastic stack rookie. You're not someone who's an expert, but if uh, you are, that's great, stick around. You might learn something. So the goals for this presentation are to discuss modern challenges in data engineering and look at the elastic stack and how you can get started or enhance your current usage. And based on my experience, I'm gonna share some anecdotes, use cases and recommendations. So pipelines, streams, what are they? So pipelines are an incredibly overlooked term in this industry, but for this presentation, we can define them as something that's batch or schedule based, something that's ETL. Um, they are typically slower to deliver insights and we move the data around on demand. So you can think Apache Airflow, Spotify's Luigi tool or other workflow schedule based systems such as Jenkins, Team City, and other CI builds. Um, and as for streams, we're not talking about low latency, so anything under 100 microseconds or hard real time, which I would say is around uh, less than 20 milliseconds. So that's not this presentation, that's a separate presentation, uh, which would be super interesting. But you can definitely think millisecond and subsecond latency. Um, think fast and near real time. So uh, processing thousands of uh, credit card transactions in a second, say. And when we're talking about streams, we're talking about processing data as it's received. So either a consumer pulling it or having data pushed to it. And the tech stack you can kind of think about is like the likes of Flink, Kafka, Spark, and message buses such as RabbitMQ. So data engineering, it's the business of systems, services, and infrastructure. And QuantHub does a pretty good definition of what a data engineer is. So data engineers design and build pipelines to transform and transport data into a format wherein by the time it reaches the data scientists or other end users, it's in a highly usable state. If I was to explain what I did to somebody, I would say I find and make data usable for product systems and stakeholders. And use cases include big data and fast data ingest, providing the business with intelligence to aid decision making and making contextual product enhancements such as recommender systems or fraud detection. And it's an area that bends with trends. So in recent years, we've kind of moved away from these big monolithic architectures into microservices and more and more into the cloud where we're using no code solutions and third party, third party software. So new tools and programming languages come and go. And uh, in recent times, we're seeing industry adopting streaming approaches more and more. So the day-to-day -day struggles that we as data engineers face is taming large complex data infrastructures and integrations. Um, places I've worked previously and at Elastic, there's fewer no data engineers who understand the entire data plane. It's too complex and large to truly have a one person understanding of how it all works. And, uh, also, development typically slows down as things get more complex and uh, data processing can continue long after it no longer yields value. And it's hard to kind of understand where all that uh, complexity lives. So different integration points include databases, data warehouses, also cloud providers, there's lots of them these days, our edge services, third party APIs and more. So there's a lot of integration that we have to care about these days. And it just is made so complex by having too many tools, clouds. Um, there's a natural turnaround in every business, so expertise comes and goes. And there's no scattered system of record. 
also synchronization between all these different services can be a tricky business and scaling batch ETL and Lambda architectures are, they can be quite difficult. So this is a rather extreme case, but Uber in 2018 uh, wrote a blog post, which is referenced, which they discussed having uh, over 2000 critical microservices in their fleet. And um, in one interesting point, they discussed that they had to uh, rally a group of engineers around to work for 50 services and across 12 different teams in order to investigate a root cause in one of their systems. So we also have these kind of problems here at Elastic and in previous places, like an investment bank that I've worked in, we also had those problems. Data just piles up. It gets so difficult to work with and munch and understand is the data the way it should be or not. And even before I had worked at Elastic, we adopted Elastic Search into our stack to help us monitor and manage all these different data pipelines and integrations. So Elastic Search is a search engine uh, that runs distributedly and is awesome for putting in the likes of logs and all sorts of things. So handy components include data ingest pipelines, data streams, index lifecycle management, data tiers, PMS scripts, and um, DSLs such as SQL and Equal, which we all use on the data engineering team here at Elastic. So stack management, uh, this is always a good first place to kind of stop and think, is my topology right? So um, at a previous workplace, we ran a hot, hot architecture and uh, put in billions of events a day, and that worked quite well for us. But um, as things kind of grew, we needed to revisit our topology every now and then. And if you're using uh, Elastic Cloud for deployments, you should consider looking at the official Terraform provider to store your configuration scripts in your repo. And if you're not using Elasticsearch as a service, you should consider using ECK or ECE to manage deployments, upgrades, TLS certificate management, et cetera. And there's a couple of effective topologies um, when looking at data engineering. So this is a typical CPU intensive architecture where we have one APM instance, three Elasticsearch nodes, and uh, one Kibana node. And I always recommend starting off small and then growing your topology as things get bigger. So here it, um, is one of our BI clusters at Elastic, which has 12 um, Elasticsearch nodes, two Kibana instances, and an ML node. And you can see that some of these have um, like 58 gigabytes of RAM. And we also have a lot of disk allocation to them, sometimes in the terabytes for the hot nodes. So uh, batching is a common approach used in uh, data engineering, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It typically is an important part of our architecture. And uh, you can kind of think of it as like sourcing, queuing, analyzing, enriching, and syncing the data. So ingestion to storage. And Apache Airflow is a typically a great tool for building out these diagonal workflows and managing them. But uh, they can start off small and one person can easily make changes, debug, see where things have gone wrong, but things can get on really fast, particularly when pipelines start to scale like this, where it's not entirely clear where problems could be if there is one. And these can grow and grow and grow. Like I've seen uh, DAGs of this scale around 40 or 50 times in some organizations. And it's always good to kind of have a good system of record of like what your batch BS pipelines are doing. So logs are always the first line of defense. If you can collect them, do. And, but that leaves the question of how to ship. So Airflow and other orchestration systems typically have um, plugins and uh, other sorts of functionality that you can connect straight to Elasticsearch and sync the logs in that way. And that might work really well for you. And if it does, continue doing it. But one thing we find in the uh, data engineering team uh, that we like to have a consistent approach of actually shipping our logs. So we tend to run B 
feed site cars uh, with our containers to kind of ship the data. So one thing I think is worth uh, pointing out that more isn't be always better. Um, and I think when you're dealing with distributed systems um, and they are all logging different, it's always worth structuring your logs and making them consistent across services when you can and building in contextualization such as traces. If you're not already adopting it, if you're not already, if you don't already have a schema, consider adopting one such as the Elastic Common Schema, as those can really help when building out dashboards and uh, keeping consistency across your logs. So from memory, we used to create these POJOs in uh, Java and uh, serialize them and write them out as logs because we could afford the performance hit, although it was incredibly tiny. And we would collect everything from the application name to the event that was running the Unix app book, the thread name, the exceptions, and the exception details if they were there. And we would just uh, create these POJOs and log them out in our application code and our uh, different systems. So uh, streaming tends to be the next big thing, and a lot of companies are moving to it in order to kind of drive real-time recommendations and real-time product enhancements. So it wouldn't be uncommon to kind of see uh, an architecture like this, where there's a web client talking to Kafka as the central data plane, which is uh, being consumed out by Flink to drive real-time insights, and then uh, Spark streaming, consuming out data from Kafka and writing it into Elasticsearch, and then a batch-based process enriching um, new data coming in with cold data in a data lake, such as S3 or uh, Redshift or even another Elasticsearch cluster, and then visualizing it in a Spark notebook. So uh, one thing we have, that we've noticed in the past is sometimes we need additional on-off stack infrastructure to kind of do uh, this kind of scale as data coming in can be quite volatile. And so um, writing from beats into Kafka, particularly if you're uh, consuming out again into different microservices is incredibly beneficial, but also doing enrichments with Logstash and then into Elasticsearch can also help with structuring your logs if you need them. So moving from indexes into data streams recently uh, has proved incredibly beneficial for us because it's allowed us to kind of age um, data into warm and cold notes and help save us significant help save us significant money. So these tend to be append only and they're great for logs, metrics, and other continuously generated data. And we use ILM to automatically help us with index management. So a search request is done over all the data stream backing indices, whereas an uh, write operation is only applied to the last uh, backing index. So a lot of teams don't typically want to use big data tooling such as Flink, Spark, Kafka, but they want to kind of bring their own code and tools. And we do a lot of that as well in the data engineering um, team. We have a large uh, OCaml pipeline, which is used for analyzing malware. And I guess this brings me into the last section today, which is looking at some advanced use cases of the Elastic Stack. We're just looking at APM and machine learning. So Elastic APM is this really cool app that lives in Kibana, but also deploys out a single standalone server, which you can connect your applications to. So they provide multiple agents such as Java, .NET, Go, PHP. And we use it to check service and infrastructure uptime with pings. We also use it for service maps and distributed tracing for our, our architecture. And it has really saved our um, team a couple of times when it comes to TLS cert expiry. And recently we've started using alerting functionality and soon we're going to start utilizing cases to communicate to each other issues with the data pipeline. 
And also we find that it's incredibly data engineer friendly because it supports a lot of integrations such as Kafka, Rabbit, MQ, MySQL, and it has great programming language support. It also has community support for OCaml, which is written in the team that I'm currently in, Erlang, and some others. So here is a screenshot of our um, uh, APM services monitoring dashboard with some data obfuscated. Here we can track the latency and throughput of some of our services, and we can see which services are uh, proving troublesome. And this allows us to visualize the latency and throughput of some of the services as well. And also we find this incredibly beneficial where we can see where the majority of uh, our, our requests, time and code could do with some optimizations. Service maps have definitely helped us big time as our uh, architecture has grown and more people have came onto the team and we as an organization have grown. It's only going to get more complex and understanding how everything fits together is going to prove incredibly important for us. So by also utilizing the machine learning capabilities, we can also highlight anomalies and get deep insight into performance of individual services and traces. And it's also helped us spot some issues before they've happened. So one thing that we have started doing is writing in uh, test results from uh, CI into Elasticsearch, which is not an APM feature, but I think it's worth mentioning for this presentation, where we run our tests on a temporal cadence and then put all the test input into Elasticsearch. And then we just create simple visualizations and dashboards with Lens. And uh, this has given us context of stuff that we need to uh, keep an eye on, improve code, improve reliability, and uh, provide uh, better service and meet our SLAs. So the summary, feedback loops have been key for us, and they can definitely help you. So by testing, building, shipping, observing, and iterating, we've, we're managing to build an excellent data plan, uh, which is scales well and is easily debugged if we find anything wrong with it. So the takeaways you can take away from this presentation is the Elastic Stack helps operate data workloads. It understands data integration and processing, and we can use APM and ML for enhanced observability. And there's tons of great integrations, such as AWS, GCP, uh, JVM specific, such as JMS or JWC, Vault and Zookeeper, and many more. So thanks, I'm Pete Hampton. You can find me at GitHub working across multiple Elastic repos, and you can also find me on the community Slack. Hope you're having an awesome Elasticon.